Okay, very good. Got it. Okay. Great, you muted me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, one more. I would like to stay muted. Also, mute your speakers. I should keep my video on, though, Pablo. Keep my video on. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, yeah, you could, you could click got it. Oh, I didn't click it. That should do. Okay, let me, let me do this one. Is it working? Okay, you, you can also use this one if you wish. Okay. And uh, but then I need to I need to plug this in order to, to change this. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, so we are slowly plugging in, and uh, we are almost ready to go. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to see you. It's been difficult two or three years, and. Uh, I'm very happy finally we have a chance to, 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 to meet together. Um, great to have you here. Um, and we'll have a few, let's be fascinated, very fascinating talks come, coming week, starting uh, from Shayan. Um, there will be a few announcements on the way. Uh, maybe let me just say one thing. I, I know that the, we are on the way, downside of, of the way of COVID. However, uh, in every conference, well, one of my students is coming back, somebody is always bringing something. Uh, therefore, we placed in different places, especially at the entrance, to, to, to do on masks and uh, the, the hand sanitizers. Please feel free to do it. I would feel very bad if you got COVID on the conference. We organized. I hope everybody will be able to get back home you know, without COVID and without problems with both hands. So, so let, let's hope for that. Yeah. So keep in mind that there are the face masks, please feel free to do it in there. You know, the, the classroom is quite big, so, so you can spread. Um, about the coffee machines and other social events, we'll, we'll have a separate announcement soon. Uh, but it's, start, it's good to start talking about boring stuff. Let's speak about something interesting. So I have Shaya. Um, when the last conference happened, Shaya was in Duke. That was good, but it's better. He's in. Uh, Leipzig right now. Uh, and I'm very happy to have Shayan in Europe, and I'm even more happy to have Shayan in Kundlevo opening uh, our conference and uh, speaking about modeling shapes and fields. Shayan, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. So, uh, oh, I could turn this on. One second. Um, there should be a button on the top. Ah, okay. Uh, I would like to first uh, thank the organizers and uh, it's really exciting to start seeing people again live and um, that's been a lot of fun. I'd say flights by Lufthansa have been less fun, but you know, we do what we can and uh, um, I just moved to Germany six weeks ago. It's been an exciting and interesting process. Um, and this is work that I've been doing with many collaborators for a while, and I uh, and it's been really fun. But one of the reasons it's been really fun is that um, the results that we have have been published in biology journals, stats journals, um, applied math journals, and, and my understanding, uh, my very very limited understanding of Russian, is that um, the word for clean and pure is the same. So. Even we published this in uh, clean journals, um, but um, 
with that, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so <clears throat> one of the real uh, geniuses of Darwin uh, was before Darwin, uh, the way people thought about organisms and animals, and plants as well, but mainly animals, was a Linnaeal system where people really thought about the platonic ideal of a duck or a platonic ideal of a chicken. Right, or other types of platonic ideals, and you really saw the terms that we that we now also see in uh, geometry, the word a uh, generi and, and genus, and so on and so forth. And uh, we have a little bit of static, but uh, but but so one of the things that that uh, dark. Should I turn off the mic, Pablo? The other one? Okay. I do. Let me turn that off. That's a good idea. I'll just uh, hello. Uh, let me just go back to this one. Better now. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, so as I was saying, there's this idea that was really important, is that what you're interested in is not the platonic ideal, but variation. And this is an example uh, from uh, Darwin's Finches. And what they realized was really interesting is that variation in the shape of the beak of the finch. And if you haven't read, uh, it's called The Beak of the Finch. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Okay. This is another picture. Um, this is not my collaborator, Doug Boyer, but these are bones that he works with. These are heel bones. And one of the things he's really interested in is understanding variation of these. And one thing you could do is if you could take these heel bones, get pairwise measurements, you could build a distance matrix. From that, you can construct a tree and you can ask, how does this phenotype tree vary from a phylogenetic tree? And this may be an indication for something that's being selected. So just some ideas, right? So this idea of modeling shapes, it's not new. Apparently there's a guy named Newman who thought about it a while ago. Uh, but but in, in more modern days, there have been kind of three primary ways of thinking about it. One was by Kendall, uh, where he looked at what is now called the landmark-based approach. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Then there was a different morphism-based approach uh, uh, popularized by Grenander, but people like Mumford also worked on this and thought about it. And lastly, there's an integral geometry approach, which I'll, I'll push harder on. Okay. And uh, you can unify these approaches. I'll show you some pictures that slightly project. Okay, so what happened back in the day, you'd go to the British National Museum and you put down landmarks on your favorite artifact. And then you put down landmarks on your other favorite artifact. And you pretend that these are all corresponding landmarks. They're the same on one and the other. And then what would you do? You'd match them. You basically find the closest match between the modular locations and scaling and translation. And this is what's called Kendall shape space. And this was a way that we modeled shapes for a long time. There is a paper, it's a little bit dark by Pearson, where we use this approach to try to figure out whether the desiccated skull that people attributed to Cromwell was really Cromwell himself. And you don't want to know about what they did to do that stuff. Uh, now, what, what they're doing more nowadays, this is my collaborator, Doug, but I also have a collaborator actually at the British Natural History Museum. Uh, and both of them have collected massive databases of uh, micro CT scans of shapes. And they want to analyze these and they want to compare these. And it seems very sad to take this very detailed micro CT scan and turn it into a bunch of landmarks and then analyze it, right? So, so there's work, uh, this was done by my collaborator, Doug, and one of my, uh, my collaborator, uh, Ingrid, uh, 
do, uh, where they use the diffeomorphism based approach. So you put down the landmarks, you put down little circles around them, and then you use a variational computation to move one to the other, look at the cost of that, and that's your shapes and weight. Now, it turns out in many real data sets, these are examples of fruit flies, uh, you don't have this diffeomorphism. You may not even have a homeomorphism, right? You get extra lobes, you get extra pain, right? So, so these are these are changes. And uh, this picture is from David Huell, and uh, and it was used by uh, Ezra Miller in a very uh, nice paper, I think, in the notices of the AMS. So, what do the data actually look like? The raw data we get are meshes. So you get a bunch of vertices, faces, and sometimes edges, right? And so this is actually the data format. This is called an off file. So you get all the coordinates of your vertices, and then you get the triangles and so on and so forth. Okay. If you stare at this a little bit, you might say, huh, this looks like a simplicial complex. And you would be right. So simplicial complex. This is one way we think about a shape. Um, again, as you see. So these are not legal. Now, this is another way we think about shapes. And the reason why I'm telling you this, and um, there's something I want you to think about as we go through this talk. The way these data are generated, right, is through a physical mechanism. But mathematically, that physical mechanism is doing nothing but Euler calculus. So what's happening? You have a shape. It's a, it's a real object in the world. Okay, you go to a micro CT scanner, what does it do? It takes a bunch of electrons, pushes it through the shape, looks at what the projection looks like, does this from many, many, many directions, and then solves the inverse problem of reconstructing the shape. So far, so good. So now you can ask, what are the weakest conditions under which this inverse problem is well posed? And I'll tell you those conditions in about 12 slides, right? But they have to do with some notion of measurability. And specifically, they have to do with something that's called an O minimal structure, which basically tells you just if I take any coordinate wise projection, right? And if I look at some notion of Euler calculus on this, it's tame. It doesn't change too much, right? That, that's what all of this business is telling us. Okay. So <clears throat> we will use this idea of constructible sets. These will be our shapes in this broadest category. And we'll also talk about constructible functions. And I'll define those in a little bit, but just think about that as if I take any slice through the shape, right? My Euler calculus is t. Okay. Now, the picture of shapes that I want you to have in your head, and this is something that Ingrid and I talk about a lot, right? and I think it's a really nice picture, and it actually goes through the different representation. You have a base manifold. Things like evolution, things like other things are happening on the base manifold. Think about that's where your genetics, that's what your change is happening. And then you decorate, yeah. Oh, the mic is off. Hello? Was it back? Yeah, okay. Okay, so you have this base manifold and things are happening. Evolution, things are happening on the base manifold, but then your objects themselves are somehow a fiber. You're decorating this base manifold with a fiber. And you can think of those different representations as your fiber. So let's say this is your organism, these are monkeys. I think they're monkeys, yeah. They're all monkeys. Um, and, um, and then you're interested in some part of them, right? And you, you somehow store that as a vector. And, and the picture that I want you to have is that the landmark based version, right? You have a fixed number of points. These are points in 3D. You can think of this as a vector bundle, right? Now, if I move over to the diffeomorphism based case, you have. Um, Similar thing, but you have a fiber bundle is how you're representing or decorating these shapes. And, and what we'll talk about more today is um, so what we'll, what we'll talk about today mainly What? Hello? Hello? I do not have like with microphones. Um,
No, 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 that, that's not good. I'm not sure these have batteries in them. I mean, they, they were supposed to change it. Mm -hmm. okay. What we'll talk about a lot today is another version. And in this version, you replace that base manifold with post sets and you will replace the fibers with stops, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, okay? But the picture that I'm trying to send you is the space manifolds, and then the way you're decorating the objects and representing them are different. Okay, so what the approach that I'm going to advocate for is you take a shape, somehow I transform it, and the transformation uh, is easily representable. It's a matrix, it's a vector, it's something that I can use downstream in statistical and machine learning algorithms. I want to transform space and I don't want to lose any information I give it. I want the map to be injected and I want to be able to pull back. So what I mean by that is once I do some analysis in the transform space, I want to be able to come back and say what coordinates in three space are the most representative, right? So I want to be able to interpret what's going on. Okay, so we're gonna look at two types of topological summaries, Euler characteristics and persistent homology. This is a picture, I just kind of like this picture, but again, it's this idea of abstracting. And so what's the Euler characteristic? Vertices minus are just plus faces in the mesh case. And so what we'll do is couple that with the idea of a height function. You take a direction and you sweep through the shape, you look at sub-level sets and you ask how the Euler curve changes. So here's an example with a hand in 2D, and I'm just showing you what the sublevel sets look like. Um, and if you take this across many directions, what do you get? If you discretize it, you get a matrix. This is capturing critical points. And sometimes we do things like we uh, integrate it and zero meaning. So, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about why we do these different things in different cases. I think this is homology. You have connected components, one cycles, two cycles, and then you can do persistence homology. So what we are literally doing, the analog of the Euler curve, you could do persistent homology transform, where you're just doing you know, more theory through the shape in different direction, right? And this is the uh, 1D version for zero homology, but you can do more, okay? Persistent diagram, it's a bunch of points, uh, in a diagonal, which says infinite multiplicity. You can measure to find out the Bosch sign of two metric between two sets of points. One of the things people have proven is that um, there is a stability result in terms of these bijections. Um, so let me be a little bit more formal. So what does this Euler characteristic transform do? It lets us, it takes a shape, M, which is a constructible set, looks over the sphere and maps it to a constructible function, right? Another way you can think about it, take your shape, take a direction V, go a distance T, right? Look at the sub-level set of that shape in the direction V for all values, uh, for all uh, distances less than T and compute the other characteristic. Similarly, you can do something called the smooth other characteristic transform where you take the other characteristic, you integrate it, zero unit. And so this gives you L2. And some, Applications, these are very nice because it lets us do statistics. And lastly, you can also do what's called the persistent homology transform, where you go along the sphere, map it into a diagram, and you can do this for zero to one up to D minus one homology. Um, so just checking the time. <clears throat> it might not be shocking that there's a commutative diagram it turns out that a lot of applied topology talks are computative diagrams. Uh, and what, what, well, probably topology talks as well. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the information that you have in the persistent homology is also the other characteristic transform, and you have more information in the persistent homology transform. And I'll talk a little bit about this as we go on. So one thing we can now do is we can define distances between objects. Basically what you do, take the transform, take your metric on the transform in any direction and integrate it over all directions. So far, so good. And maybe I'll cross dimensions. Now, one thing that we will see <coughs> is my computer does not want to integrate across all directions. 
because it, it just doesn't like to do that. And so I have to disregard that. And we'll talk about that. But at the heart of what I'm showing you, and I said this before, is actually how these shapes are constructed. And that's by the way down here. So this is my object. You basically are pumping it through, right, with, with, with x-rays. You're looking at what the projection looks like from many directions, and then you reconstruct it. So this right here is the most general condition under which the radon transport is invertible. And this is sometimes called Shapiro's inversion result. And you know I can talk about this, but there are few things on this slide that are actually relevant. And the main thing is for Shapiro's inversion result to work, you have to have this O-minimality, that's the minimal measurement requirement. And the other thing that you have to have is kind of some notion of matching across a fiber, across projections in each direction, right? So that's kind of the important thing in the slide. And if you notice this, this is just an Euler calculus. Again, everything is happening because there is an Euler calculus. So when we first, so my colleague Kate Turner should probably be given credit of coming up with the Euler characteristic transform. Her and I worked on this and then we worked with Doug. Um, and uh, when Kate and I first came up with this, we improved injectivity. We almost proved it algorithmically. We didn't use a Shapira type result and we couldn't get beyond dimension three. And so later on uh, with Justin Curry, Kate and I, and at the same time, Rob and the students use a Shapira inversion result to say that you can do this much out, right? Both for the other characteristic transform and the persistent homology transform. But this raises a question, how many directions do you take? Right? And the answer in 2D is 162, and the answer is 3D is you know, around 700. Right? And these are, these are very hard costs, no, I'm joking. Um, so, so the, but there's a question of how do I think about this problem? How do I think about how many directions there are? And if I think about this problem, does it teach me something about the math that's going on underneath? Does it teach me about the modeling, the algorithm? And does it even teach me something about the physics? Right? And, and what I'm going to argue to you is, there's something really interesting going on. Now, if you have not read this paper, read it as soon as you can. There's this paper by V.I. Arnold. It's called The Calculus of Snakes. And what does it ask you? It asks you, if I tell you what the critical points of a function are, can you tell me how many homologically different functions are there with these critical points? What is amazing, and V.I. Arnold is amazing, he gives a closed form solution. It gives a closed form solution using coxeter groups and, and, and other ideas and it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so now in our case, I'm gonna tell you the following. I have some moduli space of shapes embedded in D dimensions, okay? And they're gonna have a few properties. At each vertex K, I can lower bound some notion of curvature. Now, what do I need to, why do I need to do that? It turns out if you have something that's super flat and you have another thing that's super flat, it's really hard to tell them apart, right? So if you want to tell apart shapes, you need some control of how flat you want to be, right? There, there are questions about like, I think it's a joke. Can you tell apart love of princess from a pen? Right? Uh, if anyone's been to love it, it might be fun. But, um, but, but the, so there you have to have some bound in flatness. And the other thing that you have to have control over once you have that boundary flatness, if you look in the cone related to that curvature in any direction, right, the, the, the change in critical points can't be crazy. You have to have some control of the tangents, right? So that these are the two things that you need. And if you have those, I can give you a bound. But before I give you a bound, I want to show you a picture. And I want you to actually think about the radon transfer. So what's happening is we are taking a sphere, right? And we're chopping up caps of it, right? So you're stratifying a sphere and you're chopping up caps. And what you can say is if you have some notion of regularity, which I just defined on the previous slide, if I know what the Euler characteristic looks like, let's say around that orange dot, and then I just change it slightly, there's a linear relation between these Euler characteristics. So what we're saying is, once you look at these projections, things are locally linear across these angles. So, you know, one thing I could have told you is, hey, when you're doing your data analysis, don't even bother 
inverting the uh, and coming back, right? Um, the transform, right? Well, we write, you, you, you know, you've got all these projections initially, and then we reconstructed the shape. And then what we're really doing in a sense is just undoing that and then analyzing the data. And again, the reason why is once you look in the projected space, things are locally linear. And so this is our upper bound. It's ridiculous, um, but it's an upper bound. Now, there's a practical problem hiding behind this, which we started working on, which is, um, I'll give you an example. We are doing a project right now where uh, we're looking at gliomas and we're, we're doing imaging and we're observing people with gliomas and the idea is unless things get really bad, we're not gonna treat them. The idea is not to treat them because sometimes the treating the malignant cancers can evolutionary put pressure on them so they become worse, right? Now, let's say you have a radiation budget, right? And that you can't radiate a person all that much. So you want some constraint on the imaging. So a very basic question is if I have a priori, or this could happen in breast cancer, if I have a priori set of data, can you tell me how many directions and what direction I should use to get an epsilon approximation of the micro CT, right? This raises that question. That's a practical and really useful question. Okay. <coughs> now, I told you before, there's a notion of shape space where I talk about um, landmarks. There's a notion of shape space when I talk about diffeomorphisms. So you can ask me, is there a notion of shape space when I talk about these Euler calculus, like the persistent homology transform or the um, uh, Euler characteristic transform? And the answer up to a month ago was we don't have, but now we do. So this is work with Justin and a really wonderful Shreya. Um, and so the first thing we did was you can take this fiber perspective and use it to define uh, a sheath perspective on the persistent homology transform. So you can take the persistent homology transform and sh quote unquote sheath it, right? And that's what I'm telling you right here. It's a push forward of a constant sheath. Um, and so this is what the persistent homology transform looks like. And this is the analog of the fiber in the case of the, um, Diffeomorphism based approach. And so then what do you do? Okay. The objects are constructible sets. You replace the notion um, of the base manifold with uh, post sets and inclusions, right? That's, that's what's replacing that. But you need some notion of continuity, right? Uh, and what you do is you, you do some work, realize that this is a Grafen deep site and that uh, there, there is a form of a homotopic limit here and you have a sheath. So we have the sheath theoretic uh, construction. And one of the things that was interesting that came out of the sheath theoretic construction is if I have a mesh, all I need is zero degree homology. You actually don't need higher order homology to capture the information. Um, as soon as you have positive curvature, you do. So the sphere, you do, but you can always triangulate, right? So again, this is one of the things we learned, which was kind of cool. Okay, I, um, I told you we did some work that was applied. Um, if anyone thinks that most of what I talked about so far was applied, they're delusional. Uh, so now let's talk about the applied stuff, okay? So this is an example of a, this is a glioblastoma, okay? It's a brain tumor and you can use some code to segment. And I'll tell you that is not easy to do, but there's stuff that works. And, and so what we're going to try to do here is the following. Um, I have 92 patients and I have matched gene expression and MRI data, okay? <clears throat> and these morphometric features are features that a reasonably large group of oncologists and radiologists work together to figure out we think these are good. These are kind of pointless, or like how round is it? How wide is it? You know, what five features? And these are what we did from our uh, our our representation. And we wanted to ask two really simple questions: How accurately can you predict disease-free survival? 
and how accurately can you predict overall to that? Okay. So, and one of the questions you might want to ask is, um, which of these features are doing better? Okay. Now, now, one, well, there's a basic thing that's going on here, which is there's this area of radio genomics, which is including imaging radiology data, the genomic data, and a lot of the motivation for this is how do we get more regular information from patients in a non-invasive way? Okay. Another way you can think about this problem is how do I use shapes in a regression model? Okay. So this is how, how we did it. You can do it in other ways. We took these slices of these MRIs, took the Euler characteristic in different directions, and we just stacked that up as one massive vector. Now, we could have done it in other ways. And there's one thing that I think is really, really important when we think about um, applied topology, which is picking your filtration. Right? And I think we always go, oh, I did this filtration, I did that filtration, but it re it's really worth it to think about the filtration and what you want to represent. What do you want to mod out, right? So there are cases where, um, you know, you are rotationally symmetric, right? And so you might want to mod that out. So again, I think it's really, really important to pick it up, that filtration. Okay. We used initially the following model. Later on, we've also used deep neural networks because Everyone else does, but we used a very simple model. It's called a Gaussian process model, and um, and um, <clears throat> this is again where choices. You think about choices. You actually matter. Um, I didn't show you results, but when we studied how similar the bones are of those uh, different of those calcania of the different um, um, really monkeys in the universe, um, we use the persistent homology because it's a little bit more stable and it worked a little bit better. Here we did, here we use the smooth letter characteristic transform, and for two reasons. Functions in L2 have a nice inner product structure, right? Whereas persistent homology, if you try to define a covariance kernel or covariance matrix based upon inner products, it's probably not going to be positive sign down, right? So there's, so there's that, that issue. And in statistics, there's a tremendous literature on something called functional data analysis, which is how do you take curves and do stuff with them, right? And what I've told you is I've taken the problem of uh, modeling a shape and turned it into a collection of curves in L2. And so I can just apply functional data analysis. And this notion of Gaussian processes is a very classic idea of that. So just in 2D, these are my data points. Um, I put a little Gaussian on, bump on each one of them. Right? I weight them, and this is the notion of my regression function. And what's great is everything is linear algebra and involves one annoying matrix inversion that's NQ, but you know, other than that, it's not so bad. Now, I can ask you, should I use just a linear cor correlation as my similarity between the points? So that's called a linear kernel. And then I can also look at distance-based one is uh, this notion of a Gaussian. Another one has heavier tails, it's called Fulci. And then what we can do is we can look at all of these and ask, okay, which method is doing the best? Which of these features are doing the best in classification? And we find down here are the, uh, the topological features. So what do we do? We take 80% of our data, build a model, test on the accuracy on the remaining 20%, we do it a bunch of times, and this is giving us the uh, uh, root mean squared error. And this is telling us what percent of time these set of features are doing the best, right? So you're actually seeing this representation is useful. It's actually doing something, right? So so that was that was a, that was kind of cool. Um, so then we asked the question. That's all well and good, and you know. Classical statistics, the thing that you do right after you do uh, regression, people do variable sort. They ask, you know, which of the coordinates are the most relevant, right? So you can actually ask the same exact question for a shape. It's a little bit harder because we don't really have coordinates. But you can ask, what points in 3D space are the most different between the most of the shapes? What have the greatest amount of variation? And so that's what we did. 
And we came up with a method which uh, my collaborator, Lauren, is much more creative and much more cool than I am. So he called it Sanak. So I'm gonna first give you a picture, right, of how Sanaka works. Let's say this is class one, class two. You can think of these as the molars of lemurs that eat insects, the molars of lemurs that eat fruit, okay? So then what do I do? I basically compute the Euler characteristic transform. So here we don't use a smooth version. I'll tell you why in a second. But actually, I'll just tell you why right now. If you smooth this, you're averaging information across all of the points, and you don't want to do that, right? Because if you want to do variable section, ideally, you want to see where are those chunks, right? Where are the variables? Okay. Okay. So then, and I'll tell you what our variable selection algorithm is in a second. But what we do <clears throat> is we use a variable selection algorithm to tell you in which direction and at what height, right? Do I have the greatest amount of variation? So once I have that, then transforming that back to a 3D coordinate is a problem in projective geometry. It turns out in this applied case is not so bad. And so what I'm showing you here are false color picture where the red are the location that are most varied. And this is between one class and this is between another class. We, um, we did, you know, for the paper we wrote, we did not have biomedical applications. But when we put our paper up on BioArchive about six days later, we got an email from people at Genentech where they were using this for uh, case control studies in psychoactive drugs. That's when we realized we should probably put some type of license on it. But anyways, okay, so, oh shoot. I screwed up. Give me one second because I realized I just deleted a bunch of slides. This should have some of them. Sorry about that. I thought I kept them. Up. Oh, shoot. Okay, today we are having some difficulties. Um, something will work. Okay. Uh, that's why I picked the wrong one. I'm really, really sorry. I, I, I do have one. Okay. Um, I don't, I, I'm, yeah, Some, nothing horrible should happen. Did it pop up? Oh, oh no. You stop share. Okay. Okay, great. So this should work. Okay, great. Yeah. And again, I really apologize for this. Okay, great. Okay, so I told you about the classification algorithm we used, right? That was the Gaussian process. Okay, so we worked out a way of thinking about variable selection for nonlinear regression. So in regression, what do you have? You have a bunch of coordinates and you have the effect size, like this beta, which tells you somewhat how relevant that is. It's a notion of an effect size, right? Um, and so we, we generalize that for a nonlinear case where you fit a nonlinear function, let's call it F, and project back onto your coordinates, and that gives you an effective notion of beta. Now, the other thing that we were able to do is we had this as a sampling algorithm, as a Bayesian algorithm, so we had Monte Carlo draws of these beta hats. So you can actually think of getting all of these estimates of the beta. And then we're going to make a really, really reductionist assumption and pretend that this is multivariate normal, 
just to make our lives a little easier. And the reason we do that is in the following step. So one way of thinking about whether a player is useful or a variable is useful is you just remove them from the pool and you see how often they win, right? And this is, this is what we call centrality and ranking, right? If you remove one player, the team might lose a lot more than if you remove another player, right? And so what you can do, and this is why we pretended everything was multivariate normal, is you can just remove the variable, look at what the Gaussian distribution looks like, or you can integrate out that variable, look at what the Gaussian distribution looks like, right? These are the same dimension, they're Gaussian. You can compute the KL divergent closed form, and this gives you a score, okay? And again, the score is zero, if and only if, you know, um, there's no information. You normalize that score, and that's what we call the rate variable. And that rate variable is what we're using to use to do the selection. That tells you which direction and in what height the most variable uh, points are. Okay, so that's an evidence of association. Okay, now I can go back. I'll stop and share. And another point I want to make is, there we go. I really do want you to think about this as a pipeline with some logic. You could have swapped out the Gaussian process with a neural network. You could have swapped out one of the representations possibly with another representation if it works better, right? And so the last part is once I give you the direction or the height, how do I recover the 3D coordinate, right? And the way we recover that is actually, goes back to that picture which I was showing you with the caps. So if I know in one direction, right? Uh, I know direction V is important, and I know height, let's call it T, is important. What I can do is I can just generate a small cone right around that to recover the 3D direction, right? So this is exactly what the algorithm is. And so, you can also think about this in terms of linear algebra, right? You don't know x, y, z, right? This is the direction, these are the heights. You construct an overrepresented set and try to recover x, y, z in a small cone. But the actual algorithm we use is just this. You take the little cone, you look at the intersection set, and that's what you call your relevant coordinates. Okay. So one of the things that was really interesting for us is we have an algorithm, we think it works, We've done simulations on really silly things like little spheres with spikes on it. But how do we know that this actually works in a more controlled simulated case, right? How do we, how do we think about this? And so what was really fun is we went into the uh, <clears throat> computational geometry literature, and there are people who make characters, right? So you can take a tube or you can take a face and you can make the nose bigger, or you can make a cuspid larger, right? So that's actually what we did. We took an original shape. We actually controlled the way that we caricatured it. And then we looked at our reconstruction and we saw, were we recovering the right features? And, um, you know, these are not so exciting. These are a bunch of ROC curves on more or less complicated sense settings. But the point was we, you know, we understood a little. And so uh, our, our kind of our last example was on, um, these are all lemurs. And this one is known to have this type of custard. As you go further away evolutionarily, it kind of starts going away, right? And so we said, if we construct a classification pass between this one and this one, this one and this one, and this one and this one, and then do the subset, sub uh, shape selection, what does it look like? Does it give us back something we would expect? And again, we, we, we started seeing that in this case, we weren't really seeing the cuspid so strongly. You start seeing it as you go a little bit further evolutionarily, and even further you start seeing it. So you start to recover some of the things that you would actually want. Um, recently, 
Um, and this was really my collaborator, mainly my collaborator, Lauren's work and I came along for the ride, is we adapted this to protein structure. So here you have um, the 3D coordinates of the protein. Then you thicken it out, put right in the right molecules. This is what's called a ribbon diagram. It's another way of representing it. And we basically applied something very similar. You have these two types of maybe a wild type protein, a mutant protein. You then go back and you uh, go from here, construct this inflational complex. You uh, look at topological features. And then here we used a slightly different algorithm um, because in the case of the protein, you don't get so smooth jumps. Sometimes the jumps are more localized. We did variable selection and uh, again, did some type of reconstruction. And from that, you can get these types of ribbon diagrams. I just wanted to show you one case. We found something called the uh, gamma loop of the lactamase, and it's induced by this mutation, right? So again, this is a way you can start manipulating and getting at what might be underlying differences between shapes. And again, it's a common pipeline, but you have to think about what's the right representation, both in terms of the shapes, but as well as in terms of the algorithms. So recently, we've been asking, okay, that's great, we can do this with shapes. What happens for soft tissues, right, where it's not just a shape and it's a vector field? So the answer there is, how do I do Euler calculus on real function, right? And, and there are people who've worked on this. There's some very nice work by Rob Grice and Yuli Brishnikov and their colleagues, and, and they give a, a form of this with rounding. Um, but what we did was something a little bit simpler. We worked on something called the lifted Euler character transform, where you filter not over a direction only, but also the actual value. Now, one of the people who use this notion of a high function a lot uh, for MRI, but also for uh, cosmic radiation, where people like uh, Jonathan Taylor and Robert Adler and uh, Keith Worsley. And what they were really interested in are the topological structure of random field, right? And so they're filtering by what the actual function value was. We're doing the same thing, but we're also filtering in direction. So um, this gives us a bigger matrix, right? If you just concatenate everything. Uh, a lot of the things that I told you about the Euler characteristic transform transform over to the lifted Euler characteristic transform and we can get bounds on the number of directions. But <clears throat> what was kind of fun is we applied this to a breast cancer data set. And we effectively did as well as an extremely well-trained neural network, almost off the shelf, using a simple Gaussian process, right? So that was, that was kind of cool. Um, Okay, we will end in time. Um, there's so much to do, right? There are ideas of dictionary learning here. Um, I didn't talk about this, but uh, another really good thing about this perspective of having a base manifold is if you actually want to do more formal fiber checks. So if I want to say that these collection of molar teeth Right, uh, from Madagascar, which is where the molars are, uh, are evolving the Brownian motion or Ernst and Lindbeck or what's called the first model. What you can do is you can define a Gaussian process on the base manifold using very classic genetic ideas, define a fiber on the bundle, and try to integrate it out and get more formal estimates of, uh, of the selective pressure. Now, when you do this, there's one really important thing. I didn't put this slide up is the following is a fact. If you want to put a stochastic process on a manifold, and if you want to define a kernel function which gives you a covariance matrix that's positive definite, your first inclination is to do the following, which is increasable. Write out that covariance function as e to the minus of GOT system. Okay, this seems not a crazy thing to do. You can prove but that will not give you a positive definite matrix unless the manifold you're looking on is isometric to the Brownian space. And if it is, this is just a pointless exercise, right? So the way to quote unquote correctly do it is you have to solve an SPD. But, uh, but anyways, there's a lot of interesting work there. Integrating the genomics with imaging. One of the things that we really wanna do is generate random shapes, right? How do I turn this into a generative process? There's a, 
And there's absolutely beautiful work on lifting stochastic processes on manifold using fibers. And this is work of Galvin, Eels, Ellsworthy. There's a wonderful book by Elton too. And there's a really basic question, which is extremely open, is how do I extend this to sheets, right? How do I extend this to situations where, you know, the dimensions aren't all the same, right? And then and, and how do I do this? Um, there are, you know, practical problems in extending this to structural biology microscopy. And one of the things we're really do, trying to do now is, um, so you have this different you want to I gave you, or I suggested that maybe you should use this uh, Euler calculus based approach. Can, can I show you under some metric, under certain things that's reasonable, that when I have this uh, Euler calculus based approach and I have different work with it, I get back to the fiber case, right? These things kind of match up, you know, for the limited case where they're the same. This also begs a very basic question. When you don't have diffeomorphism, what is a gold standard distance computation? Right? Like, do you use Grama Pauldor? Hopefully not. I don't know. Right? There, there's some work where you know that was done using Hamlinger integrals to compare these, right? But that's that's still uh, that's still quite open. Um, Integrating with the physics of imaging, I think there's a lot of interesting things there. <laughs> Over time, there are people who've talked to me. Turns out that now there are people in multiple countries that have given me money. I thank all of them. I, uh, I thank you. And again, the main thing I want to tell you is that this has been a really fun project. And, you know, we've worked with all kinds of people using all kinds of tools. And uh, hopefully it continues. And I'll end with that. Very much um, questions. Yes, Dimitri. Well, the first is a trivial question. What is number three? Uh, what, what is that? I, uh, that's me late at night forgetting. That's okay. So, so my, my, my real question is this. Um, you started by talking about landmarks and alignment. Then when you went to these transforms, you never came back to the question of like how do you factor out this with right? because you get that's the projections a, so, on that one. So Dimitri's question is really good. So let me let me so when we submitted the Sinatra paper, we sold it as you know, you can do all this stuff without requiring landmark. And one of the reviewers very naturally asked this question, how did you register them in the first place? Okay, so um two things. The way I'll tell you one approach of registering because I worked on this problem, which is <clears throat> first compute all the pairwise distances using whatever you can. Um, then you kind of rotate them to align them the best you can, construct the minimum standard tree, then iterate this whole process and put things don't change. Okay. Now, what I didn't show you is a slide we have, which is if you take, let's say you want a perfect. You think of your directions as random, right? And then you just think of this as a collection of a bunch of random uh, vectors. And you basically look at optimal transport. They'll match. So what you can do is you can use that idea with an encoded rotation matrix to try to do the alignment. So it's kind of like ICP, you doing ICP on Very much like ICP, yeah. Yeah. Good, further questions? Okay. Yeah. So, in the part that you were talking about this uh, kernel function on the Riemannian manifold, so the assumption is that the data set is on the Riemannian manifold, and you said that if you just take the geodesic distance on this one and just take the exponential of minus of this distance, you just have the isometry with the Fourier aspect. So, and then why this? This happens because this Euclidean heat kernel is some kind of discretization of the Riemannian heat kernel. Why should we have the isometry instead of just right. discretization? So, okay, so okay. what I was trying to say is the, ol the only case where when you do this and that kernel is positive definite, right, is when the other underlying space is basically equal. It's iso iso isometric to the Euclidean. 
Um, now it could be that you know the negative eigenvalues are small, and so you could truncate them and you could go on with twelve, right? Um, but but what 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 the the, the 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 real point is if you work out when is lifting Brownian motion on a manifold unique, when does it work? Right? The basic construction is you have random curves on your base manifold, you lift them, right? And then you show you have some type of martingale, some nice structure on that lifted structure. And then you take that and you embed it, um, you know, um, using Nash or something else, right? And you show that you have a martingale and nice structure in that space as well, okay? And then you show kind of, you can walk back and forth between all of these. Now, the natural way of walking back and forth between all of these is actually solving a stochastic differential equation, right? So that's why you go back to something where you have the Laplacian times your function is equal to Brownian motion. And you solve that, and the solution of that gives you your curve. Right? Because it goes back to this Brownian motion, SD. Right? You might get lucky, right? And you might be very close to positive definite. And if you just truncate meaning things far enough away and just set the zero, you might be okay. But no guarantees. It's a short question. When you use the minimal structures for describing your uh, shapes, what kind of a minimal structure do you use? Okay, so <clears throat> the short answer to that is we never absolutely, okay, we never specified. We just use the fact that for the O minimal structure, you have tameness to get something back. But really, what we're using are semi algebraic sets. Okay, right? this, this, this was my idea that you yeah. should get semi algebraic sets. Yeah, through. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just didn't want to specify all of that. Because, uh, that uh, you know, that if you go to Fatian or some exponential uh, or minimal structure, then these kinds of estimates that you write in terms of complexity are somehow doubtful. Yeah, yeah, that, they're shady. Uh, in in non-polynomial bound. That's right, they become shady, exactly. But yeah. But any further questions to Shayan? No, let's thank the speaker again. Just quickly to the speakers.